Okay, we're a couple of minutes past the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started, even though we'll probably still have um, a few people joining. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar in the series Happy 25th Anniversary Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Units, or CESUs, um, Successes in Science and Scholarship Management Partnerships. My name is Lisa Gerloff, and I am the Executive Director for the Rocky Mountains CESU. Uh, for those of you in our audience who may be unfamiliar with the CESU network, it is a national consortium of uh, 17 biogeographic units comprised of federal agencies, academic institutions, tribes, um, state and local governments, um, non-governmental conservation organizations, and other partners working together to support in one stewardship of our natural and cultural resources on our federal uh, federal lands. In celebration of the 25th anniversary of the network, um, this series is highlighting successful partnerships between subject matter experts and managers facilitated through two of the first CESUs established back in 1999, the North Atlantic Coast and the Rocky Mountains. Um, two weeks ago, we had our first webinar in this series, um, which focused on an example from the Rocky Mountains, uh, the Crown Managers Partnership, or CMP. The CMP is a partnership amongst federal, state, provincial, tribal, and first agency, uh, first nation agency managers and universities in Montana, Alberta, and British Columbia. Um, the CMP works collectively across borders to tackle shared ecological challenges and concerns throughout the crown of the continent ecosystem, which at its core includes Glacier National Park in the US and Waterton Park in Canada. Six CMP steering committee members presented on the origins and evolution of that partnership, the role of the CESU played in partner relations and in supporting many projects, um, including the Crown Landscape Conservation Design and um, highlighting indigenous leadership and partnerships across the Crown of the Continent ecosystem. Um, that presentation was recorded and is available on our Rocky Mountain CESU website. And I will put a link to that recording in the chat box for you shortly. Today's webinar, Modeling the Combined Effects of Storms and Sea Level Rise in New England to Inform Coastal Management, highlights two projects funded through the North Atlantic Coast CESU by the National Park Service and NOAA. Joining us is Dr. Isaac Guinness, distinguished oceanographer and professor of oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Guinness led uh, the interdisciplinary team from the University of Rhode Island, Penn State National Park Service, and the St Skudik Institute working on these projects. Um, Dr. Guinness will speak for about 35, 40 minutes, and we will have um, time at the end for questions. Um, if you have questions come up uh, for you during his presentation, mm -hmm. I ask that you type those into the chat box at um, that, that's located at the bottom of your, your screen. Um, thank you, Dr. Guinness, for joining us today, and I turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I will jump right into see my first slide uh, in which I will talk about the primary goals and objectives of our research. So our team is focusing on this, what we call a combined impacts from storms, nor'easters and hurricanes and sea level rise, in particular focusing on improving coastal resilience and protect communities. 
people, infrastructure, and also their ecosystems. We have four main components of our work, uh, which I'd like to highlight first. So the first is, of course, modeling. We have modeling, a simulation, uh, modeling of the previous storms, uh, current storms, and also future storms to better understand their potential impacts on the coastline and the coastal communities. The second important part of this project is to share the data, uh, the model outputs with uh, stakeholders at different uh, agencies and locations. And the third one um, is not only to share the data, but also engage in a dialogue with the stakeholders. It is very important as a, as a scientist to me and our team is to really to build awareness and enhance our understanding of how our results of our modeling and research can be uh, useful to make practical decisions. And by engaging in a communication with uh, stakeholders, we can also tailor our modeling work and research to essentially enhance the usefulness of our results to trying to address more specific local solutions. And so hopefully as a result of our project, we will uh, be able to provide more better information for the people to take actions uh, necessary for improving the coastal resilience, also to be better prepared for future storms, and also better understand the future in, uh, changes related to the sea level rise and future storms. So we have selected seven sites across the New England, uh, mostly centered around the national uh, parks uh, due to our close collaboration with the National Park Service and also wildlife refuge sites. Three of those sites are in Rhode Island, three in Massachusetts, and one in Maine, in Acadia. Even in the process of the developing the proposal, we, have, we engaged in a discussion with the uh, stakeholders and local decision makers across all those sites with a focus to really understand their concerns. And so what is what you see in the slides are highlighted particular questions or issues for different uh, communities. And I've, of course, I will not go into details in each community, but across all these sites, the biggest, of course, concern is the coastal resiliency, meaning for community and also ecosystems, uh, guidance for adaptation strategies, and really uh, get some information that we can share with the local communities about potential management actions, or not, in some circumstances. The key to our project is the engagement. That is essentially our main focus and the commitment of, of our entire team is, as I mentioned, to really engage with the discussion with the st st stakeholders stakeholders, and also that will help us to actually ta tailor our model uh, modeling work, model simulations to specific locations. And so the idea here is that both scientists and st stakeholders through meetings, communications can learn from one another. And that helps the scientists to develop uh, the output and the deliverables that are more useful and effective. Because ultimately, what we want to accomplish is that the, to improve the or increase the possibility of using the science-based uh, information for more effective management actions. Here's our team of scientists. is a very diverse interdisciplinary team that includes uh, the scientists who do uh, computer modeling, uh, observations, 
uh, with engagements across uh, the different disciplines. And also we have people who are with expertise in using the data of different um, uh, nature and also with expertise of actually doing direct observations and collecting the data. So since our focus is on the, this combined in, impact of the extreme weather and sea level rise, uh, what you see here uh, on this diagram is showing a storm on the left. This is a nor'easter combined with the sea level rise. And our right, and right is an example of one of our model outputs that is actually a three-dimensional view of the impact of one storm in Cape Cod. And I will talk more about the visualization, but here I would like to really emphasize that we, from our experience, we learned that uh, creating uh, uh, three-dimensional vis visualizations are very important for improving the communication with them. Uh, end users and stakeholders. So I will <clears throat> briefly describe uh, our modeling tools. The first one is uh, this AdCERC model uh, for flood prediction. It has a number of components, including hydro hydrodynamic modeling, which is modeling of the coastal water movement and storm surge, coastal flooding, it's coupled with the atmospheric model, uh, with waves, uh, and also with uh, some other components. So it's quite advanced uh, model that's been used uh, in academia, in the government, federal government, for both doing uh, research, historical analysis, and also real-time forecasting. Another model that we applied is called the X Beach, that is particularly focusing on modeling the changes in the coastal morphology, particularly during the storms, and such as beach erosion, dune erosion, and all this kind of coastal impacts that are, uh, we're really interested to uh, better understand. Um, I would emphasize in my presentation that is a very important role of coastal waves on the coastal impacts. Sometimes it's been less understood and appreciated, but especially in big storms such as nor'easters, hurricanes, the coastal waves play a very important role. The physics of waves are quite complex, so sometimes we need to use a quite advanced, sophisticated models, like this model, fun wave, fun wave that has a, a so-called non uh, phase-resolving wave, components that can provide a very detailed information on the forces produced by waves and infrastructure. Uh, part of our project, which I will not discuss it in much details, is applying our mo modeling to, uh, tools to look at the nature-based mitigation solutions, such as the beach nourishment, dune reinforcement, and enhanced veg veg vegetation or other options. As, and I, as I mentioned, an important part of our project is actually collecting the data. So in two locations, uh, uh, in two states, Rhode Island and Cape Cod, um, we, our team is involved uh, in coastal uh, observations um, led by J.P. Walsh at, at URI. So they, all, they look at the historical data, but also collect the data in uh, current storms that actually help to inform our modeling research. And I will show you some ex specific examples of the results of their work that's been very useful for conducting our modeling uh, studies. I mentioned the importance of the three-dimensional visualization. Here I just show uh, some examples of 3D visualizations uh, done in the Cape Cod. I will talk more about uh, this particular images and how they've been generated. But again, just want to emphasize, this is an important part of uh, components of our projects is to produce 
the output of model output using this kind of three dimensional visualization. And another tool that we use, what we call the interactive dashboard, uh, we developed this board as part of our other project uh, funded by the Department of Homeland Security, particular focusing on communicating our uh, modeling results to emergency managers. And this particular tool is designed to combine an interactive map uh, that shows the flooding uh, and some other uh, components of the storm with an impact analysis on particular assets or critical infrastructures. So decision makers, uh, if we have information about their facilities, can actually see through this dashboard a potential impact of, of a particular storm on their facilities. So since uh, we are focusing on the co combined effect of sea level rise and storm surge, uh, it is important also to look at the guidance of the future sea level rise. And uh, so th in this particular uh, study, we use the most recent uh, interagency reports, uh, 2022 led by NOAA, uh, from which we extracted the information on the sea level rise across the New England, which are shown here. Um, and we also adjusted the sea level rise projections relative to 2020, uh, and we use it as uh, the current sea level rise uh, condition. And we particularly uh, focus on two scenarios with one foot and three feet or one meter sea level rise. One foot roughly corresponds to uh, 2050 projections using an intermediate uh, uh, CO2 emission scenario. And three feet is roughly corresponds to 2090 or 2100. And of course, we need to realize and, and, and communicate to the stakeholders that is a, still significant uncertainties in the sea level rise projections, depending on different emission scenarios, low, intermediate, and high. And that's uh, uh, something that we need to take into account when we communicate the potential impact of the sea level rise on coastal communities. Uh, we are simulating extreme weather uh, in this project. Particular, we are focusing focusing on hurricanes and nor'easters, and in this slide, uh, I try to sort of differentiate that uh, in terms of meteorology, uh, the different uh, features uh, of the nor'easters and hurricanes, uh, hurricanes or tropical storms, they get energy typically from the warm ocean during the summer. They usually develop from June to in November. Uh, they're less frequent in New England, and they usually they have size changing from, you know, varying from 200 to 500 miles across. On the other hand, nor'easters or extratropical storms, they get energy from the temperature difference between the cold air over land and warm air over water. This is a typical, they typically develop during the winter, late fall, or the spring. And they more, much more often in uh, New England um, compared to hurricanes, and they could be very large in size. I should also mention that actually nor'easters are much less studied than, than hurricanes. And that's actually been part of our research is actually to get better understanding of the impact of nor'easters in New England. But one important uh, uh, thing to emphasize here, and, we, and which is illustrated in this figure, is that nor'easters, in terms of the coastal flooding, have much more significant impact in many places in New England, in New England than hurricanes. So here I show um, a historic data based on the tide gauge on the station in Boston which is which has about a, more than a hundred years of record, showing the big st storm surge and water levels in Boston, and the blue color shows the extratropical cyclones and red uh, hurricanes. 
And you can clearly see that the peak storm surges are dominated primarily by extratropical storms. So that's very important for us to study the storms in New England. Um, one of the things that is very important for skillful coastal modeling and skillful predictions of coastal impact is to have a very high resolution numerical mesh. And I won't discuss this in more in, in greater details, but just here I wanted to illustrate that the EdSort modeling system has a quite complicated so-called unstructured mesh, computational mesh that allows to develop uh, and use very high resolution at specific locations. In fact, we can manually adjust the spatial resolution at any locations of interest. So here I show a mesh in the middle. This is from Cape Cod. And then I zoomed in at few locations in, around this Cape Cod. And at some places, the resolution as high as 10 meter. And this is very important to, um, uh, to be able to properly and accurately resolve the coastline configuration, the local topography and bathymetry for more, more accurate simulation of the coastal you know, flooding and impacts. So I'm gonna look at a few examples of our modeling work and then uh, discuss how we present this uh, modeling results to the stakeholders. I'm gonna first uh, show you a simu uh, simulations of the January 2018 nor'easter, that was a very powerful storm that affected essentially all the states in in New England and produced a lot of coastal flooding and, and damage. And we look at the model results uh, from different perspectives. One, as a scientist, of course, we need to do a careful validation of the model predictions against available observations. We usually don't share this kind of slides with the with the local state stakeholders and decision makers unless some some of them are particularly interested in science. But I just wanted to show you how we evaluate the model performance. This is uh, simulations of um, water elevation at few sites across the New England, Bar Harbor, Maine, Boston, uh, Woods Hole, and Provincetown. And here's to show that while the model is not perfect, it has a reasonably good skill in forecasting both the amplitude and the timing of tides and timing of the arrival of the peak storm surges. Uh, this is another um, uh, graphics that show the simulation of the waves uh, using the SWAN model at different locations. Again, you see a, a pretty reasonable simulations of waves, amplitude, and, uh, and the time series. So the information that we do communicate to stakeholders, are, examples are shown here. So this is just a simple, relatively simple column maps of the flooding uh, in one particular area in the Cape Cod um, uh, region. So on top, this is simulation uh, of water level with no sea level rise uh, for the entire Cape Cod. And then on the right is actually zoomed in in the northwest part of the Cape Cod in the uh, Provincetown area. And the color shows the magnitude of the inundation. And below is the same simulation, but is done with the one meter sea level rise. And then you can clearly see that the differences particularly looking on the right-hand side, comparing the top and, and low figure, you can see not only the magnitude of the flooding, but the spatial, spatial extent of the flooding is significantly affected by the sea level rise. And that's very important message to communicate that potentially with the sea level rise, the coastal impacts will be significantly increased. So this is the same kind of output, but now it's done in a three-dimensional uh, view using three-dimensional graphics. And I should mention this all effort is led by Professor Peter Stemple from Penn State. Uh, this is the one visualization of the Race Point lighthouse, lighthouse in Provincetown. And this is a simulation with 
Uh, so this is before the storm. This is after the storm. Uh, you can see the coastal flooding. And then it, when we increase, include the sea level rise, you can see much more significant flooding. Again, I won't get into details of the coastal impacts. I just wanted to illustrate uh, examples of the graphics that we uh, can generate uh, for our engagement with local communities. I mentioned the importance of the waves uh, in terms of coastal impact. Um, so this is an illustration of one actually quite important point that not very much appreciated is that the actual wave impacts will increase with the sea level rise. So on top is the simulated so-called significant wave height during this January storm. So red color shows very high waves with addition of the one meter sea level rise figure on the bottom right. You see some increase, but what is more instructive is to see the figure to the left showing the difference between the waves simulated with and without sea level rise. And what you can see that near the coast, up to half a meter waves that are simulated with the sea level rise. So not only the storm surge coastal flooding will increase, but also the uh, amplitude of the coastal waves and their impact of, on coastal structure, structures will increase as well. This is another uh, um, three-dimensional visualization of the same storm now we are focusing on the, this is the east coast of uh, Cape Cod uh, in the East Ham, Massachusetts. It's a, where our lean circle is. And in this three-dimensional graphics, you can see a quite realistic digital visualization of the buildings, the landscape. And, uh, and that is, again, very important that people can see better the potential impact on the locations that they're most, most interested in. And we, we find that this type of visualization is by, by far uh, more informative than just simple flood maps that usually you know, scientists produce. Here's the same uh, simulation of the same storm, but now with a one meter sea level rise. Of course, you can see by, by far much more profound impact uh, we, we, we see uh, from this combined effect of the very powerful storm and one meter sea level rise. Just looking at other location, but the same storm, this is Maine, focusing on Acadia, Maine. Uh, maybe we could look at the right top, in particular focusing on, on Acadia Bar Harbor Road. Uh, so we can see the flooding produced by the storm, and uh, this road has partially been flooded. It's actually a very important road in Acadia. And with a significant, with a uh, one meter sea level rise figure below, you can see significantly higher elevation, uh, water elevation and, and flooding. Here is the visualization of that particular road focusing on the uh, Trenton Bridge and this is flooding. You can see now three-dimensional view with, with, with the vegetation clearly shown. And uh, with, with this uh, current storm, uh, with the current sea level rise, sea level, and that's now with the one, uh, one meter sea level rise impact. Of, so I can switch back and forth and you can see the, the differences. While we're conducting this project, we had another big nor'easter that affected New England in December of 2022. So here I show some uh, pictures of the flooding in Rhode Island. And we see all kinds of different coastal impacts, like uh, the bridge of, of, the, of the, this bridgeway in uh, South Shore Rhode Island in Charleston, uh, beach erosion, dune erosion, uh, overwash, uh, and, some, and flooding in some roads, road closures. So all this kind of a classical impact of the big storms in, in New England that we are trying to model and predict in, in the future. 
So here's the, uh, you can see examples of the very large waves in uh, South Kingston, uh, Rhode Island. So we've done the simulation of the storm uh, using the EdSERC model. Uh, here I show focusing on a mini grid pond uh, uh, in the south shore of Rhode Island. And, uh, and you can see the differences uh, between, uh, so, so I'm sorry, water level on the left and wave height predictions on the right. And particularly, I want to uh, emphasize this uh, barrier beach that separate the ocean uh, from the Ninigret pond. And of course, there's big concern during the storms that this uh, barrier beach can, uh, beach can be uh, eroded or compromised um, by the storm, by the waves and, and storm surge, and potentially flooding can extend into the pond. Uh, locations and surrounding communities. So we also produced a, a very detailed flood maps. Um, it's actually using a high elevation, uh, high resolution DAM data with one meter resolution. And here's an example of the inundation of the same storm. Now we can look at the more specific locations uh, and you know throughout this region. Uh, this is another example of um, a December storm impact. Uh, this is in uh, a nitty grit uh, Charleston area. This is Charleston Beach Road. And uh, on top is the map produced by our model. And below is the this building, is Kayak Center. And uh, you can see that model predicted the flooding and that location. We actually often do use uh, actual pictures uh, or flooding and to validate the model results in addition to comparing with the available uh, observations from tide gauges and other sources. So now I want to switch gear and uh, talk about observations that are being collected by our team led by JP Walsh. As part of this project, they do bi-weekly uh, scanning uh, of um, some uh, uh, beaches in Rhode Island and 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 uh, and Cape Cod, uh, using this tool is called the terrestrial lidar setup. Uh, lidar it actually can provide a very high resolution um, analysis of uh, morphology of the beach morphology. On the right hand side, you can see the output from this uh, observations. And very importantly, we can use these observations to monitor the changes that are uh, taking place on a daily basis due to tidal forcing uh, and wind, but more importantly, that we can see the changes during big storms. And so during the, this 2022 Nor'easter, that it's uh, uh, the comparisons between of the impact of, on the few locations shown here and, and uh, documenting and the magnitude of the beach erosion and the uh, effect on the on the dune system. And then one of the outputs is it's kind of more science-based output. You can look at the cross sections at different locations and you can see the changes uh, between the pre-storm and post-storm and then it, it, you could quantify quantify those changes, and then we can use this to validate the model simulations. So now I want to switch gear and talk more about the engagement effort, uh, which is a big part, of, as I mentioned, of our um, project. We have an engagement team that's been uh, helping us to communicate with the different uh, stakeholders at different locations. Of course, I won't have time to look uh, through uh, this diagram uh, focusing on the highlights from different um, uh, priorities for different communities. But I just wanted to focus on on the left uh, uh, column is that this is Nina Get Trans uh, Trust um, Pond in South Shore of Rhode Island, which has a bridge, uh, a bridge, a beach barrier. 
and similar to Cape Cod, they have the same concern about uh, what is, was going to happen to the uh, dune systems and what they what they need to do to make them more resilient uh, in the in the future. So I'm going to particular focus on on this issue now. Uh, so this is the zoom in image uh, of the uh, barrier beach uh, that separates the ocean and the Inigrate Pond. And here are particular concerns uh, local, uh, raised by local management, uh, focusing on the potential dune breakdown, questions about uh, vegetation management, and also questions about post-storm restorations. And this is another uh, image from the same location, slightly more to the east. Here we have a, a bridgeway, bridge, bridgeway, which is very important for the local communities here, which been often affected by the storms. And uh, the question has been raised about uh, the sedimentation of the bridgeway, the need of doing regular dredging, and also the structure of the bridgeway uh, itself. It was built 72 years ago. And the big questions about how to sustain uh, the, the structure into the future. The specific issues about questions about this road, which is uh, along the shore, which is un unpaved, the questions of whether it should be paved or not, how it should be ma maintained, and again, how it should be uh, restored after big storm events. So we have, our team has uh, conducted several site visits. So we see pictures of actually meeting with local stakeholders and decision makers. Uh, JP Walsh holding this map on the uh, photo on the left. Uh, Pam Rubinov is taking notes um, here. And this is the, uh, on the right is the image of the bridgeway. And so based on this interaction with the local community, we created a three-dimensional three view of the area. And that uh, was, was helpful for us to do the model simulations. Here's the output of the one of the simulations we have done with the EdSerg. Uh, it's a sandy-like storm with no, no sea level rise. This work is still ongoing. But again, by focusing on this particular management issues, we can look at some specific questions that have been raised and then tailor our model simulations uh, to help to address these concerns. And I also want to show you this actually new type of visualization that Peter Stample created. Now you can look at the beach with a moving camera. And what you're seeing here is the output from the X beach modeling the impact of um, the st uh, st sandy-like storm uh, on uh, beach erosion and sediment transport. During Hurricane Sandy, there was a significant movement of sand inland, which is actually simulated quite well by this model. But I, I think this is very interesting and probably more informative uh, way to communicate the model output, I'm actually wondering if you have any comments on that. I'm going to show you another example. This is a simulation uh, of the Trustum Pond with the same storm. But here you can see the breaching of the barrier, beach barrier, and dune bre uh, breaching at several uh, locations. And again, you can use this moving camera to really help to visual uh, visualize the potential impacts uh, of this kind of storms. So, and finally, uh, I'm happy to highlight that the city of Charleston, which raised these concerns about the beach way, uh, bridgeway and their local uh, beach uh, barrier that we've been interacting with, uh, interac interacting with, they just received funding from the state, uh, focusing on um, uh, this, uh, investigating the uh, uh, design and uh, the structure of the Charlestown uh, bridge, uh, Bridgeway. 
And uh, this is at a design stage, but potentially can lead to uh, next phase in actually developing a, a specific um, solutions. And we are happy to collaborate uh, with the town of Charleston on this project. And they already emphasize how important for them to receive access to our modeling results. And also this, we will be help, helping them to design some other model simulations that will help them to guide uh, the better understanding of the future impacts. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Isaac. Um, yes, let's open it up for questions. If you have questions uh, for Isaac, please type them into the, the chat box. As we give, oh, okay, here we go. Um, the question is, how do you compare the influences between extreme weather versus SLR? Um, so this is a very good question. Um, actually, the impact of the sea level rise is varying from one location to another. It's very sensitive on, on the details of the coastline, the details of the local bathymetry and, and topography. So the way we do the modeling of the sea level rise, we essentially initial, initialize our model from the beginning with the higher water elevation, taking in, into account the sea level rise. And essentially we are looking at the combined effect of the storm induced changes in the coastal flooding with the sea level rise as a part of the solution of a numerical model. So the sea level rise is not added to the storm effects that's done in some other studies. We believe that there is really sometimes nonlinear interaction effects that are quite important to take into account. So to answer your question is that essentially sea level rise is accounted as part of our model solution solutions. Again, if you have questions, please type them into the, the chat box and we'll um, share them with everyone so Isaac can answer. I was, uh, while hopefully some folks are, are typing in their questions, I'll share. Before we went live, I was telling Isaac that as a person who grew up in the Midwest and now live in the Rocky Mountains and has spent very little time uh, on the coast, um, very interesting just to see um, what the issues are are on the coast in regards to storm and sea level rise and and um, what can be done to to mitigate to mitigate that for communities. So interesting, both uh, our last seminar a couple of weeks ago and this seminar, very few questions coming up. Um, our presenters must be just doing an excellent job of uh, presenting their projects. Well, if there's no questions, I, I don't want to keep you on. Um, I want to thank um, our audience for being part of our um, seminar series uh, celebrating 25 years of uh, the Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. 
um, uh, this presentation um, is being recorded. And as I mentioned in the chat box, it will be um, shared on our um, seminar page and that link will be sent out to all of you. So again, thank you for joining us and thank you, Dr. Guinness, um, for being part of our, our series and um, presenting on your work today. Thank you very much. All right, take care.